Hello and welcome to this webinar for National Fertility Awareness Week with Fertility Network UK. Today we are joined by Dr Sarah Martins de Silva from the University of Dundee and she's going to talk to us about male fertility. So I'll hand over to you Sarah, thank you. So thank you very much for asking me to speak today. Now I'm a senior lecturer in reproductive medicine. I'm also a fertility specialist and I work in the IVF unit in Dundee. I can't change my slides. Oh, there we go. So you may already be aware that infertility is defined, defined as the inability of a couple to um, conceive after 12 months of regular unprotected intercourse. And this is based on pretty good data, looking at couples prospectively who were embarking on trying to, to get pregnant and found that about 50% of them conceived within three months of trying and nearly three quarters of them conceived within six months of trying. Now, after 12 months of trying, the chance of conceiving still continues to increase, but the rates of increase are small. And it's usually a fertility consultation referral. But although this is a common phenomenon and lots of people are affected by infertility, it's important that you know that your chance of conceiving is most predominantly affected by the age of your female partner. So if she is 36 years or older, you may want to consider asking for referrals sooner than 12 months and perhaps after six months of trying for a baby. Now, before you have an appointment at our clinic, we'd normally ask the GP to arrange a diagnostic semen analysis. And here are the important numbers that we are looking for. We want a sperm concentration of 16 million per mil or greater with about a third of them or 30% of them swimming in a meaningful way, so progressive motility, and 4% of them to have absolutely perfect morphology. In other words, they look perfect from an idea of what your chances of conception are. And the reason that that's important is because that will then um, lay the scene for what your next sort of treatment options are. So we think that there's a, a male factor that is underlying or a causative problem in about half of all cases of infertility. But the reality of, of, of things as they stand at the moment is there is currently no treatment and there is currently no cure. So when we talk about treatment, what we're really talking about is artificial reproduction technology. What is artificial reproduction technology, you may ask? Well, it's a combination of the different offerings that a fertility clinic can offer. So that might be interuterine insemination, although I would say for heterosexual couples that are able to have unprotected intercourse, I'm not sure that there's a massive advantage to IUI. But certainly is injected with a single sperm to achieve fertilization. And predominantly for men where, or couples where men have an issue with their sperm, then ICSI is likely to be the most uh, often recommended treatment. So the clinical reality is we currently have an unmet need. There are no treatments that can directly treat men who have fertility problems, except for very exceptional circumstances. And therefore, you're likely to be offered treatment which will be directed and orientated towards your female partner for your health problem. Now, ART can be expensive. It's not guaranteed to work and it's not risk free. The scientific reality is that although we uh, are trying to explore and understand male, male reproduction and sperm function better, there are really very specific difficulties and challenges. They move and they have virtually no cytoplasm, which is the kind of content inside a cell. And so the sperm cells act in a very different way to most other cell types. They only have half of the normal genetic material of other cells that they're difficult to work with. And actually, if you look at animal models, for example, mouse sperm, the, the, the sperm work in a very different way. So it's very difficult to know how to get sort of knowledge and, and, and further research. And because we don't really understand the biology of sperm, that's why we have difficulties in terms of, of knowing what treatments to develop, because we don't know where to target drug therapy. 
So I'm working in Dundee and in the University of Dundee, we have two particular departments based in the School of Life Sciences. One is called the Drug Discovery Unit. And what we've done is we've uh, built a high throughput screening system. It's a research sperm swims and how a sperm fertilizes an egg. And what we can do is look at big libraries of different molecules that are uh, you know, uh, developed to be used as medicines and see which of them, if any, have the right uh, calcium response and therefore could be potentially developed as a treatment for male infertility. Secondly, and more recently, we've moved on from that to something called phenotypic screening. Again, a partnership between the university, the NHS, um, and various departments within the university. And what we're trying to do now is use that same library screening, but specifically looking to see if we can make sperm swim better. And there's lots of common complex and, and, and technical reasons why that might be a better approach to take. And whilst we've already developed these assays and we're starting to, to screen compounds and so on, we've got a, an active programme of drug de development for male infertility. But we still carry that aim to develop a prescribable treatment for male infertility in due course. But we're not there yet. So in the meantime, when you come to clinic, it's likely that we may spend some time thinking about what you can do that isn't medical treatment to try and improve your chances of conceiving. And a lot of this is focused around lifestyle modification. And you may also have come across a discussion and debate about antioxidants, i.e. vitamins or dietary supplements that might improve your sperm. So let's think about the basis of all of this. So there's a concept called oxidative stress. Now, in the course of normal cell metabolism and normal cell function, all cells produce highly active molecules called reactive oxygen species. Now, these are oxygen ions and free radicals and peroxides and so on. Now, they're really, really cell metabolism, particularly things uh, uh, that improve how a sperm works, something called capacitation, but also how a sperm can then fertilize an egg specifically acrosome reaction and beyond. Now the issue with oxidative stress is, it's a, is a, a, a problem when if you're producing these reactive oxygen species and you produce too many of them is that actually like most things in life too much of something is, is not a good thing anymore it becomes a bad thing and actually if you have too much of these highly active molecules then they can start to become destructive. So the problem is that sperm, as I mentioned before, it doesn't have much in the way of cytoplasm or cell filling. So it doesn't have very much defense against too much reactive oxygen species and therefore they're susceptible cells to oxidative stress. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests that oxidative stress is a major various markers of these highly reactive molecules, but they're much higher in the semen of those men that have fertility problems compared to those who have conceived without an issue. And so we think that maybe up to three quarters of men with infertility have a degree of oxidative stress. And there's lots of different things that can contribute to reactive oxygen species. Some of these that we have control over, like being overweight or what we eat, smoking, drugs, alcohol, but also things that perhaps we have much less control over in terms of the air that we breathe, the work environment that we uh, work within, background and uh, radiation and pollution, and also advancing age. And so the implications of oxidative stress are that it can result in damage to the sperm membrane, which means that the sperm don't of getting pregnant, but also IVF treatments and so on working as well. But it also decreases how a sperm functions and the ability for a sperm to fertilize an egg. And the other kind of implication of DNA, uh, of, of oxidative stress, is that the, the DNA, the genetic material within the cell itself, can be damaged. And the problem is the sperm cells don't have repair mechanisms to robustly repair DNA damage, and we think that DNA damage in male um, is associated then with perhaps miscarriage and the increased chance of miscarriage following treatment, but also potentially development of uh, abnormalities in children born. 
So there's been a lot of conversation about antioxidants, which is an umbrella term of various vitamins and minerals and so on that protect and mop up excess reactive oxygen species. And there's lots that are found within semen. Think and selenium and carnitines and carotenoids and so on. And so there is this theory that if you took some sort of preparation of these antioxidants in, perhaps that could benefit your sperm and create correct the problem with male infertility. There's also a secondary issue, and perhaps we'll come back to this, is that we don't routinely in a clinic test for markers of oxidative stress or DNA damage. So there was a big review of all of the scientific literature that's been published to date, which was uh, brought out in 2019. And the, uh, the authors put together 61 different studies, which looked at a variety of different antioxidant supplements in, a, in many, many men and many different studies from across the world. And what they showed was actually quite disappointing. Firstly, because very few of the studies actually looked at whether taking these supplements made a difference to getting pregnant or having a whether you uh, taking a supplement would improve the chance of having a baby. And even uh, only 11 studies even looked at the chance of getting pregnant. Overall, the conclusion was that antioxidants might help, but the numbers were too small and the evidence was poor to make any sort of conclusions. Since that study was published, there have been two big studies that have come out from the United States. One looked at supplements of folic acid and zinc, which the men took for six months, and a parallel group took tablets that had no antioxidants in them, which we call placebo. Over the course of the study, however, the authors showed that there was no change in sperm count or how sperm swam or how sperm looked down a microscope, in other words, morphology. Nor did they show any positive effect on pregnancy or live birth, nor did they show any effect on reducing miscarriage. And perhaps in an increased risk in DNA damage, an increased risk, but also that they showed that couples where the man had taken supplements had a higher chance of having a baby prematurely. A second study, called the MOXIE study, also looked at a combination of different vitamins. Now remember what I said, the different combinations of, of uh, naturally occurring antioxidants that are in semen. So this is quite a clever thing to have done to try and re, re uh, um, you know, or add in um, supplement uh, the antioxidants that are already present within, within the man. And they gave these men treatment for three to six months. And similarly, they showed no improvement in sperm parameters, no change in DNA damage, and no increase in pregnancy or live birth. Although to be fair, this study was really primarily looking at sperm uh, parameters and DNA damage and not whether you could get pregnant or have a baby. Nonetheless, I think this goes as involving lots of people, that antioxidants is going to make much of a difference to an individual man and a chance of conception. And actually, this was a piece published in the Daily Mail um, back in January 2019, where I kind of came out and I said, you know, I don't think fertility pills help men become fathers, but I think they're extraordinarily pricey. And I think it's maybe a false promise. And I still stand by that. So what I would say is, I don't think we have completely the answers for antioxidants, but I wouldn't spend a lot of money on antioxidant supplements. So we're back to this list again, that I mentioned at the beginning about what we think about with you in a clinic. So let's think again about this. So smoking, yes, smoking causes oxidative stress. It's really bad for your personal health as well as your reproductive health. So if you're a smoker, stop smoking. Alcohol, I think there's less clear evidence about I don't think saying that no alcohol uh, is fair, but I think a limited amount of alcohol, if you wish to have a pint or something, that's absolutely fine. I think when you're pregnant, we certainly wouldn't be expecting your, your uh, partner carrying the pregnancy to be drinking at that stage. Caffeine, again, difficult to know what the evidence would suggest. If you're anything like me, I need a, a cup of tea or two to get out of bed in the morning and get, get going. It's fine to drink a little bit of caffeine. Actually, if you add caffeine to sperm, it does seem to make them swim better. So actually, I would say two or three cups of tea or coffee a day is fine. 
The thing perhaps to be more aware is there's a lot of uh, products that are marketed as sort of beverages with caffeine and also a lot of sugar in them. And these are probably likely to be less good for your reproductive health. I would probably suggest avoiding or limiting what you drink in that sense. Diet, I think is really, really important. We talked a bit about antioxidants. than taking a diet that has fruit and vegetables to be able to take in a good amount of vitamin C and E and zinc and so on. So think about what you're eating. Plenty of fruit and vegetables is a good thing for your diet for fertility. If you're overweight, I think thinking about weight loss is also good. We know that that can uh, increase, uh, uh, obesity can increase oxidative stress. And lastly, I'd like to think a little bit about stress, anxiety, depression. I've bundled them all together, but I think we need to be really, really in tune with ourselves and think about what being in a stressful situation, like trying to have a baby and not succeeding, or a work situation or a home situation or a money situation. There's lots of things that can really make us feel quite stressed and anxious. And we know that stress and anxiety can have an impact on, on, on stuff. might be that it reduces the amount of testosterone in a, in a man's system but it might be something else over and beyond that now it's easy for me to say get rid of the stress and depression out of your life but i think acknowledging that it might have an impact on what's going on is important and then thinking about how you can take personal kind of ownership of that is also hugely important lastly i'm a huge advocate for a good night's sleep we know that testosterone is released during a certain type of sleep pattern, and that's obviously very important for your male reproductive health overall, but sperm production as well. So ultimately, everyone's a little bit different. Some people need a little bit more and a little bit less of sleep. Some people are working night shifts, and obviously quality of sleep is a different thing when you're home exhausted after working a night and trying to sleep during the day. But overall, what I would try and aim for is somewhere between seven and, hours, uh, seven and nine hours sleep In conclusion, male infertility is common. About one in eight guys have some sort of issue with their sperm count. Most of you will produce sperm, but perhaps fewer in number, or perhaps they swim less well. Overall, perhaps about 1% of men have no sperm in their ejaculate at all that are in a fertility clinic setting. We don't understand sperm biology very well. I hope I've outlined that life, life exposures are important. But I also want to be candid and say that I don't think that correcting all of these is enough to potentially fix a male infertility problem. IVF ICSI is highly effective, but it treats your partner and not the problem itself. And then for that reason, we need more research and we need to, to kind of develop drugs that can be taken by men for male uh, fertility problems. men and couples to challenge this status quo, to raise awareness. And I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Fertility Network UK and also Him Fertility for putting this subject on the table to be discussed further. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was really interesting presentation. We did, um, you did freeze a little bit during it every so often, but I think that there was enough there to, for people to really get the full gist of, of what you were saying. I mean, do you think at present maybe men have enough tests when they go to the clinic because i know we get reports from sometimes from men they feel they get a bit overlooked i mean are there things that should be done for men in clinics that are often not at the moment do you think so i think you know ultimately what i've tried to um share is you know semen analysis is really the only test that we do routinely for all men now certain um guys whether benefit from further testing and I haven't gone into it but you know a, a sperm count of under five million per mil or thereabouts would usually kind of uh, kick off sort of uh, hormone investigations genetics blood tests and so on um, but you know it's really frustrating isn't it there's not really anything else to offer men and as I've tried to put in the slides here as well I think the other issue that I'm really conscious of is that to treat him I'm actually treating her 
And I think that is part of the problem why men feel overlooked and sidelined is actually then a, you know, a lot of the consultation becomes focused around what treatment's gonna happen with her. But I, I don't think that's an excuse. I'm just saying that's the lay of the land and you know, how we try and include men is perhaps a conversation that we need to pick up with male patients. So should men, more men be seeing an andrologist, do you think, when they go to a clinic or is it not always necessary? In, in, and have a real kind of passion and interest around the subject of male infertility. So, you know, I work along that side of urologist if I need to, um, but most of the time I, I wouldn't. I would hope that my specialist knowledge covers both women and men. But I do think that within our specialty, perhaps we are guilty of being more female oriented to specialists. And I don't think I speak for everybody saying, saying that, you know, that, that knowledge base and that specialist base is covered. So I guess a cry to my colleagues is, if you don't feel comfortable handling that conversation or handling that clinical uh, problem in front of you, then pull in some experts that can help and who are specialists in that. We often hear that male fertility problems are getting more common. Is that actually true? Is it more common than it used to be for men to have problems with their sperm? You know, that's a great question. I think, you know, there's been lots of data, hasn't there? You know, some people have said it's scaremongering and others have said, you know, this is really where it stands. There was a, a donors across the United States, there's a persistent issue, which is that sperm counts are Now, as it stands at the moment, the, the, the count on average is, you know, not anywhere that's going to threaten our existence as a human race. But I think the problem that I kind of am trying to get to the bottom of is understanding why that would be. Why are sperm counts falling? What is it that affects how a sperm is built and you know, is it the environment? Is it drugs that we're exposed to? Is it what our mums when they're pregnant do before we're even on this planet? And I don't think we really know the answers, but I think we, we need to be asking those questions and trying to find solutions. And for men, are there any signs that they might have that they could see that they might have? I mean, is, are there any warning signs for men that you might have a fertility problem in the way that for women period problems might indicate that you, know, you were less likely to be easily fertile some men have a low testosterone level and low testosterone is you know you know hugely important because testosterone is the signal that helps sperm uh, be built within the testicles now unlike you know women as you say who have quite obvious symptoms actually there are symptoms of low testosterone but they might creep up on you quite gradually and you may be less aware of them but certainly i would ask guys you know are you shaving less frequency frequently because uh testosterone drives to you know uh, body hair growth so if you if you have a beard it's difficult to to know for sure but if you usually are shaving your face or mustache then then you know being aware that you're doing that less frequently rather than every day it's now every week or whatever then that could be quite a good sign an early morning erection is the other thing that is very much driven by testosterone levels so if you're experiencing issues with your libido but particularly issues with early morning erection that can be a, a, a clinical to check your hormone levels. But most of the time, hormones are fine. And, and as I say, most of the time, we don't find an explanation uh, for, for fertility issues. And uh, finally, I just really wanted to ask you, how close do you think we're getting to be able to do any more to help men? Because as you say, it does seem at the moment as if we're very much treating women when it's a male problem. I mean, are there developments that you think we might see coming down the line soon that could make a real difference? So I don't know if you saw, I snuck in a slide of a, of a publication that we um, brought out at the beginning of this year. We're looking at a drug uh, which um, is catchily named at the moment AZD5904, but it's an AstraZeneca drug. Now, clearly AstraZeneca have had been a lot of busy uh, bees in a, a lot of different areas to do with the pandemic. But this is a drug that was originally looked at, it's an anti-inflammatory, it's an antioxidant drug. done some studies looking and it looks like it improves sperm but in a lab and so we are at the moment putting together a, a clinical trial I don't have the details because we're still waiting on funding con confirmation but I, I do see when we get this that this will be you know such a huge step in the right direction to actually be uh, asking men to take a tablet and see does this now make a difference to your sperm count and then a bigger trial to say does this make a difference to getting pregnant and having a baby. 
That was brilliant. Sarah, thank you so much for your time today. And thank you for speaking to us. It's unfortunate that we did have a few freezes during this, but I think you've been absolutely fantastic and you've really explained so many things. So thank you very much. And well, thank you for your time. This I hope it's okay, Kate. But anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.